Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not heard? I'm sorry, not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I wish you would underline that last phrase. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be pushed? <laughs> That's what that means, folks. How shall they hear except they... How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful. And you never know how beautiful it is to go soul winning until you've been pushed into starting doing it. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings, good news of good things. Now, throughout this entire year, we've been studying the book of Nehemiah. I tried to emphasize how important having control over your life is as a Christian. No Christian is to be under the dominion of the world. You're not supposed to be under the dominion of the flesh, and especially not under the dominion of the devil. You are, you are now in a new kingdom. You're under a new Lord. His name is Jesus. And you're supposed to be under His rule. And so we've been talking about rebuilding our homes and rebuilding the walls that are necessary to keep what God gave us safe and strong. And God, as we talked last week, gave us some gates to have control over what comes in and what goes out of our life. Jesus said, it's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what's come out of your heart. What do you let come out of your mouth? What do you let happen with your hands? You've got to have some walls and some gates around your life. But there is a world beyond these walls. There's a world that needs what you and I have if you're saved. It is a world that needs some good news. It is a world that needs the gospel. Now, the world out there will never hear about the gospel unless someone here goes outside of these walls to them and tells them how to be saved. How shall they hear without a preacher? So, in three short words, we must go. Now, when we say we must go, where do you mean? Well, it means the Bible uses the word beyond. Um, and that means, it means several things. It means beyond our walls that sometimes we build up. Sometimes we're introverted. And there's nothing wrong with being introverted. Nothing wrong with being a homebody. Nothing wrong with being quiet-natured. But Jesus didn't say, if you're an extrovert, go. He didn't say that. He says, if you're saved, go. So you may be timid, and there are plenty of people who could never just walk up and, and go up to a maitre d' and say, that was a great meal, thank you for the burger, thank you for the steak, amen, whatever you ate. And here, I'd like to invite you to church. Let me. This is my testimony. This is what happened to me. Some people just have no courage to do that, but you can leave a track on the, on the table still. You can do something that would put the gospel into the hands of somebody else. We've got to go beyond our walls. We have to go beyond our comfort. We're too comfortable. All we worry about is, you know, how much hour, how many sleep we get and how much fun we have. And, but beyond our comfort, beyond our will. Did you know, I, may, I, I wouldn't choose, I would never choose to just, just go up and interrupt, interrupt somebody and tell them they need to be saved from hell. I just wouldn't choose that. So the gospel doesn't ask me to do what I choose. The gospel says change what I choose and do what he's willed. So I'm going beyond my own will and I'm going beyond my ability. The gospel is not about what I think I can do. I can't understand it, but uh, when I was 17 years old, I was introverted. I would rather... And God gave me a little bit of a different life, thankfully. I saw a lot of messed up people, and I chose, and I said, I'm just going to work in, in my home. I worked with electronics. I, I would stay up all night um, uh, drawing what I saw in the sky. I, have, I still have the books of all of these star clusters and nebula and planets and, and moon orbits and stuff like this. For years, I, I kept to myself, kept me out of a lot of a trouble, too. Several of my friends are dead because they got into the car with their cans, with their buddies, and they forgot, they forgot that life is not meant to be thrown away. 
But I, I, I then, when I got saved, one of the first things my youth director, like John is, my youth director looked at me and says, I want you to, want you to preach something next Sunday night to all the teens. There were 40 of them there. I never sweated so much in my life. I wrote five pages, Brother Dan, handwritten, everything I was going to I was done in six minutes flat. I just stuttered and, and shook and, and raced through it all and then wanted to go crawl under a rock. But I got started. God began to move in my heart, began to push me, and here I am now. You know, uh, what I do on a Sunday, my prayer all week long is, God help me. God help me to help somebody else. Because I can't do it. Now, I love doing it, but I can't. And so the gospel, when you hand out a gospel track, when you give your testimony, it is, you have to go beyond your abilities. Now, what's it going to cost you? What does it cost to give the gospel to one soul? What does it cost to win that soul? What does it cost to disciple and baptize every believer? What does it cost to birth another church and then to start another church and then to start another church? What's it going to cost? It'll cost you just about everything you have. And uh, that includes your money, your time, your comfort, even your family and your life, it'll cost. It just does. You say, well, I thought when I started serving God, God was going to look after us, and he does. And that we were never going to have any troubles anymore. Whoops. <laughs> Reverse that thing. You are now taking on the devil in his territory, and he's going to fight you and tear you to shreds. But you do it. I think we're about two generations away. We've lost now two generations of people that did what it took to do right. They were called the great generation, the last generation that sent their sons off to stop a madman in Germany. They stopped, they sacrificed tens of thousands of their, their young men, and they were willing to go and they were willing to, to, to sacrifice for something that was right. And we're at least two generations away from anybody that would ever give anything more than a few bob in the box. What's it going to cost if we go? Just about everything. I have a whole message on that, so just hold on to your hats. So we've got to go beyond the walls, and it begins with prayer. So Matthew now, chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. When you get there, we'll pray. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to have to take some copies of these pages, Brother Dan. I left my Bible at home, so I'm using Brother Dan. I'm noticing he's got some great notes in his Bible. I'm going to have to borrow this. Dan, Matthew chapter, I'm going to call it Daniel chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, amen here. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can just, I don't have to preach anything except what you said. I pray that I would. I pray that we would hear it and that it would change us, God, because it's your word, not mine. It's not, it's not just some thoughts, not just some philosophies. It is the word of God, and I pray that it would, it would sink deep into our hearts. God, it would be what, it's, what is needed for every one of us to become more than we are. I'm so sick of us just trying to dabble in Christianity. You didn't dabble in our lives. You came in and saved us. You came in and washed us. You came in and, and fixed us. You gave us peace. You gave us a sound mind. You gave us love and joy and peace. You did everything. And how dare we only just dabble. You've got to change us. I pray you would, please. I pray you'd save somebody this morning who's come lost, without hope, without God. I have no idea why they're here. They come, they sit. They wonder, what are you going to do? Are you really there? And I pray you'd prove to them by pulling on that heart of theirs and convicting them of sin, and of righteousness, and of coming judgment. Help them to realize there is a Savior, and His name's Jesus. May somebody get saved today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is a very busy man. Some people think that religion's all about, basically, and, and I can understand why. Because uh, a lot of religious people aren't busy. 
But when you, from the moment that Jesus was baptized, Jesus was on the go. He went everywhere calling, especially men, by the way. I'm glad for all the ladies that stood up here, but I'm glad there are at least two men. I was, I was hoping at least some guys had finished the, uh, uh, the track challenge, amen? Because God's looking for men, and he went looking for men to leave whatever they were doing and to follow him. You see, Jesus was more important than money. He still is. Jesus was more important than family. Jesus is more important than your retirement. Jesus is more important than your politics that we're all wrapped up in. Jesus is more important than your career, and he's more important than having fun. So Jesus is a very busy man, and he's calling men to follow him, and he introduces the gospel. Look there in Matthew chapter 9. Start reading in verse 35. 9.35, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus introduced the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is something no one had imagined to be more, to be more important than, than the kingdoms of history. There were great kingdoms that rose and fell like Babylon. The Persians, Greece now at that point, and, and Rome. There were great kingdoms, and Jesus said, there's a greater one called the kingdom of God. Now, this kingdom of God that Jesus promoted and talked about had no army. It had no palaces. It didn't have nat national borders, and it thankfully had no politics. It was a kingdom of people who have been born all over again on the inside changed by the Spirit of God, cleansed by the atoning blood of Christ in the place of sinful people. And Jesus went everywhere, and as he talked to people, he told them about a perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, which would take away the sins of the whole world. And beyond that, not only did he introduce the gospel of the kingdom, he reached out and he helped people. Did you notice that in verse 35? It says, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You know, there was no one that he didn't help, no matter how broken or how lost. There was nobody too far gone. Isn't that good? You see, the gospel works, and to prove that the gospel works on the most broken of minds, on the most, most darkest of hearts, is Jesus reached out and healed the most impossible of health problems. So he doesn't want to just fix your health, although he can. He wants to fix your heart. But to prove it, he would go and heal somebody. He'd raise the dead. He helped everybody. It was a great time to be alive. I would have loved to have been there. Wouldn't that have blown you away to, to, to just watch as Lazarus came out of the tomb, watch as people who were born blind going around saying, John, Susan, Larry, Ben, Ben, I never knew you were that ugly. Wow, well, amen. I mean, just to watch it would have been awesome. It was a great time to be alive. But there was a but moment. Right there in the next verse, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad and were as sheep having no shepherd. You see, when Jesus looked up from that long line of hungry, hurting, the lepers and the lame, the broken and the burdened, he saw a world of people that stretched out to the horizons. That's when he turned to his disciples and he said, guys, we need to pray. <laughs> Look down in verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's what we're going to do this month. And that's... Our focus this whole, for the rest of our lives, is we're going to pray for laborers. So let's go back through those verses. I want to show you some things about how serious we need to take this prayer request. This isn't a flippant request. I get prayer requests all the time. I get somebody, I have a friend over in, in Texas right now. His name's Danny Loftus. His wife, Laura, uh, just got diagnosed with a real serious heart problems, all kinds of things, and it scared both of them. Right now, she's waiting for some more tests, and, and she, um, 
uh, she's looking into a dark, unknown future of what does this mean? Fatigued, uh, sickly, doctor saying she's got some bad heart problems. And so you know what Danny, her husband, says? I'll ask some people to pray. And he asked me to pray. What a serious thing when you ask somebody to pray for something. I get prayer requests all the time from people. But there was one person I better take note of. And that's when Jesus asked me to pray. So we're going to look at his prayer request and take it seriously. So, start in verse 35. Jesus gave us an example of laboring. Verse 35, and Jesus went abroad, I'm sorry, went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease. I see, a, I see Jesus going into all kinds of directions. He wasn't picky into what, what village he went into or what town or, you know, I'm not going in there or I don't like those people. I don't like the south side. Those people are uppity. I don't go up to Namatanati. Even the name is uppity, you know. He was always going, and I like how it uses, my Bible uses words that I'm not allowed to use. I mean, me and Nita get into an argument, you know, I'll say, I'll say something like, you're always like this. Well, that's a lie. She's not always like that. <laughs> And she'll say something, and you never, and I go, no, that's a lie. It's not that I never. But when the Bible says all, guess what it means? All. And Jesus, he never skipped a town. He never missed a village. It says there in verse 35, he went about all the cities and the villages. I mean, he was a busy man. He focused on the most important needs. You know what the most important needs of our day-to-day, -day, it's teaching about God. I mean, our kids, our, these kids are growing up, they don't know three of the Ten Commandments. They have no idea. Uh, I was talking to somebody last night, and we, Nita was telling them about uh, 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 Jacob and Esau, and uh, uh, <laughs> this person said, oh yeah, the guy who didn't bring the right offering, and, 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 and he murdered his brother. No, that was Cain and Abel. <laughs> we have generations now that have no idea about God. They have no idea even to fear God. They have no idea how to know Him. They don't think He's there. They don't think He makes sense. They think the Bible's just a bunch of fairy tales. They watch nothing but fairy tales on TV, but they won't read a true book. You know, the most important thing in the 21st century, in 2018, is for us, like Jesus, to tell some people about God. Jesus said, if you'll lift me up, if you'll let everybody see me for who I am, I can draw all men unto me. He focused on teaching about God. He preached about how people need to get into the kingdom of God. Now, teaching is the fun part. You know, teaching is where you, you stand up and you say, two plus two is four. And everybody's going, oh, nice, two plus two is four. But preaching is, two plus two is four. And what are you going to do about it? <laughs> preaching puts the emphasis on you and what you're going to do with that information. And Jesus is up there and he's teaching and he's preaching and then he's healing, hurting people. Do you ever, you ever wonder about how people hurt? I mean, you, you're struggling with your own hurts. You're struggling with your own schedule, and you're struggling with your own nightmares that you go in and out of. And the Lord says, there's a lot more. There's a lot more. Jesus healed him. Now, Jesus could do that. Nothing was impossible for him. And in chapter 10, Jesus, he imparts to 12 men, and only 12 at that time, he imparts to them the power to heal, the power to do everything that he did. By the way, if you see or hear somebody saying they've got that same power, run from them because they don't. They can pull the shenanigans, but they cannot do what Jesus did. He healed all manner. There was nothing impossible for him. There was no demon or disease that he nor his disciples could overcome. And what I liked about it, if you look at the last part of verse 35, the last three words, what are they? Among the people. You know, Jesus did it at a level that was there where they were. A lot of people are, 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 are put off by me. Not just by me. 
but by the fact I'm American, by the fact I'm white, by the fact I'm kind of rough talking, by the fact that sometimes I just don't understand what you're talking about, and they're put off by it. But you know what Jesus did? He came down to the level of the people that he was helping. And the greatest sign of a, of a Christian leader is a towel around the waist as a servant. And what he did was, as the God of heaven, stepping down and walking around and walking up to people and being just like them. Not in sin, but in, but in the level of how they looked at one another. As a matter of fact, as far as I can read in my Bible, he came lower. He came lower. He gave us an example of how to work and how to serve. You know, he ate their food. Now, I've got some friends that I, I knew years ago. They were missionaries in Mexico. But they weren't missionaries in the big cities of Mexico. They were missionaries. This is about 30 some odd years ago. Uh, when God was calling me to come to Ireland, I became very grateful I was coming to Ireland. I didn't know what the Irish ate. I just thought they were a little more advanced than the Mexicans that I was hearing about because he said, you wouldn't believe what we had for dinner a month ago when we were down in some place out in the middle of nowhere in the most, uh, most incredible desert you could imagine. He said, we had chicken heads. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah, that's a delicacy there. And they gave us the best part. <laughs> I said, give me the worst, man. They said, no, that's the chicken feet. There's no meat on a chicken foot. The point is this. Jesus came down to our level and ate what the people ate. He slept outside on the ground. He wore their clothes. He put up with our heat. He put up with our politics and all the stuff. And the Roman soldiers walking around having command over their communities. He came to our level. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is our example, isn't he? Well, not only that, Jesus gave us his burden. Look at verse 36 and 37. It says this, and Jesus, I'm uh, sorry, but, but when he saw the multitudes, he didn't just see people, he now saw multitudes of people. And he was moved with compassion. It moved him. Can I say it? It broke him. Because they fainted. And were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, Oh, the harvest. And I like that. We're going to talk about that word in a second. But the harvest truly is what? Now, what would you say? Uh, normally, we're so terrified of the ministry, Brother Dan. Normally, we're so terrified of trying to serve others. We think, oh, the ministry is so awful. The people are so cantankerous. It's, it's no fun dealing with grumpy people. It's, it, there's no joy in helping people who never thank you. But you know what Jesus says? The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Now, Jesus evidently had a burden for multitudes. I was talking to my wife, and she was saying, what? And, and, and I was showing her some of the pictures of your Bible club, and she said, I wish our Bible club was small again. I said, so do I, honey, especially on day two. <laughs> and let me tell you, it's a great joy to start off and you have 23, and then next year you got 30, and it's wonderful. But then they turn into 100, and then they turn it to 200. You know what Jesus said? I'm helping people, I'm, 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 help, uh, I'm fixing people, I'm ministering to people, I'm teaching people. And he says, wow, there's a lot more to reach. There's a lot more to harvest. And then he looks around and he says, but there are not many helping. You see, he had a multitude, he had a, a burden for multitudes. He, he saw those thousands spread across the horizon, never ending numbers of people to reach. And he had a burden for the lost. Say, what's the word lost means? It means, far, it means far away from God and unable to find Him without help. Jesus gave, gave a parable of, of three parables uh, of, of one lost coin. The coin wasn't going to find its way back into the pocket. Another one was a, was a lost sheep, and the sheep was way out, way out in the field somewhere. It had gone astray. Uh, the, the shepherd didn't abandon it. The sheep just took off and went its own way and needed a shepherd to go after it because it couldn't find its way home. And the third one was a lost son. 
lost son who so willfully and so arrogantly said, give me what you owe me, give me my inheritance, I want to run my own life, I'm going to go my own way, and I'll be fine. And he got so low, he got so broke, he's sitting in the middle of a pig pen, the pigs are eating better than him, and he sits there and he says, how do I get home? Let me tell you, loss is not a way to live. Thankfully, God came looking. God came looking. Because Jesus had a burden for lost people. People who fainted as they waited for help. People, and right now there are people who are walking these streets, who see our signs, and they look away and they go, I could never go in there. And their heart yearns, I wonder what it's like. There are people that you'll hand a gospel tract to, and they'll see Bible on it, and they'll, they'll, they'll cringe, and they'll go, I, I, I gave up on that years ago. I, I don't want to even try again. But in their heart of hearts, they wish it was true. You know, you need to have a burden for people like that. It's nice when Brother David, where are you, Brother David Murphy? It's nice when, when you ask somebody, you believe in God, and they go, yes. And you go, woo, amen. <laughs> But you need to have a burden for the guy who says, I don't believe in God. Hey, man, you're the one I want to talk to. <laughs> Jesus had a burden for the lost. He knew the multitudes needed a Messiah. We call him Savior. Throughout history, people have needed a hero, someone to look forward to, someone to look up to, a great leader. That's how come these, these, these scumbags get into power like they did in Venezuela for the last 30 years, and how they got up there and they promised them everything on the backs of the oil companies. And they said, I'm going to help you have money in your pocket. You just elect me and I'll give you everything you need. You'll have free education. You'll have free health care. Sounds like Ireland. And you'll have, you'll have free everything. Now their economies are having a million percent inflation. You can't buy a cup of coffee without having two million of their dollars. Coffee. So somebody else will get up there and will promise them the moon. Everybody's looking for somebody to help them. Everybody's looking for a Messiah because they need him. Today this is true more than ever because science and technology and gadgets and welfare are a shallow source of hope for the deep problems of the human heart. You get depressed, last thing you need to do is look at Facebook. You struggle with loneliness, the last thing you need to do is get on Snapchat. You struggle with, you struggle with um, uh, you know, just battling um, thoughts of, of quitting and all that stuff. The last thing you need to do is a gadget in your hand. You know what you need? You need hope. You need a sure confidence. You need something that'll put you back in motion and kick, a, kick the back of your rear and get you going, it's, it's worth it. I'm, I'm, I'm not defeated because Jesus is alive. He broke hell for me. So all of this science and technology and, and, and the universities telling us that um, uh, science is on the way to making life live longer. You know what they've done? They've made life more miserable for longer. Some of you are going to get 70, 80, 90 years old, and, and they're going to be pumping chemicals into your body, and you're going to wish you could die. Because you've got no life. Science isn't the answer. Jesus is. And a walk with him is. See, Jesus knew those people needed him. And he had a burden for them. You know who's more hated than Trump? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And yet he has a burden for the people who hate him. That's amazing to me. And Jesus gave us our first duty. Look at chapter 9, verse 38 now. He says, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth, push forth laborers into his harvest. Jesus is amazing because he turns to his disciples, his followers, his people. And this is really cute. He did it one time before when there were 5,000 men who hadn't eaten in three days. You know how grumpy they are by now? And as they're looking at Jesus, and Jesus is smiling, he looks at his disciples and says, Philip, hey, Peter, hey, Andrew, you give them to eat. <laughs> and they went, what? Sometimes we forget God asks us to do the hard things. And then he shows, I didn't mean for you to do it alone. 
You know, the first thing they should have done is got right down there. He says, Lord, help us do what the Lord wants us to do. And I tell you what, Peter, James, John, uh, uh, Andrew, Nathaniel, uh, uh, Bartholomew, and, and uh, uh, even Judas Iscariot would have fed 5,000 people if they had prayed. See, Jesus looked at those disciples and says, I want you to look at that harvest that I see. Look at all those people. I don't want you to see them as customers that Apple and Microsoft and Exxon and Toyota see. You know why over there in Volkswagen, why they uh, messed with those emissions tests there a couple of years back and why they've been penalized billions of euros? You know why they do that? Because they see people as suckers. They see people as only people who they want to buy their product. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't see people like customers? He didn't say, I want you to look out there and see them as voters like Fianna Fáil. Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael sold Ireland to Europe over and over and over again. Now with abortion, it just goes on and on and on. You know why? They don't, they don't see people, they see voters and they see power. Jesus didn't say, look on the voters. He says, look on the harvest. Look at the full harvest of people for the kingdom of God. Look at the harvest. You see, he looked out on those fields, and it was like looking on a field, and this is a, 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 vi a vineyard of, of grapes. He said, look at that field of people. And something needs to be harvested. And I want you to see that it's full of fruit. It is plenteous. But there are few that are working in it. There, there, there are a few out there. They have months worth of work to do, but it's got to be done in days. The harvest will go off. It is ready to be picked. People are, are in need of somebody coming to them with the gospel, and they're dying on the vine. And I've got some people, Jesus says, and I've got some faithful people who are faithfully working, but they're not enough. If we really worked at it, we could be coming home. We could be coming to church where we're just having to turn people away and say, there's no more room in church. You'll have to go over to the other hall and sit in Sunday school. Amen. If we really saw the harvest as something that can be accomplished, as something that, that is full and ready to be picked. The problem is, as plenty as it is, there are few willing to do it. So Jesus says, pray, dear Christian. The greatest prayer request you've ever been given, the greatest prayer request you will ever pray is for laborers. He didn't say, pray for preachers. He didn't say, pray for missionaries. He didn't say, pray for pastors. I didn't ask you, Jesus didn't say, I didn't ask you to pray for teachers, or for singers, or for builders, or for bus drivers, or for chefs. I didn't ask you to pray for treasurers, or secretaries, or artists, or accountants. I asked you to pray for lowly and little paid laborers who will do whatever needs to be done to get the gospel everywhere. He uses a word, the lowest word on, on, the, on, the, on the ladder of success. You've got the top. What's the top guy? He's the chief executive officer. You know who's at the bottom? The laborer, that backbreaker, that grunt, that person who is unappreciated, who works the most hours, who works under the worst conditions, who, who works with the worst people, of a laborer. That's what you pray for. He simply said, let's pray. Let's pray to the Lord of the harvest. Let's pray for the one who is in charge of the harvest. Let's ask God that he would give us more laborers to help us in this ministry. Before you ever worry about what the will of God is for your life, and you ought to worry about it, Amen. Do you even know what God's will is for you? Well, I'm working a job. Well, I'm marrying. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm living in, in, in Cork City. That, that, that is how you've ended up. Praise God. Things may be going great, but let me tell you, have you ever asked God, God, what is your will? Is this where you want me? Is, is what I'm doing what you want me to do? Pray for laborers. 
Before you ever worry, however, about what the will of God for your life is, you need to be doing what he already clearly asked you to worry about, and that is to pray for laborers. I started to write down, Brother Dan, what would I pray for laborers? This is what I came up with. I have never prayed this, but I will from now on. Pray that laborers, that people will be soft towards God's call. Pray that they will not fight and resist God's pull. Pray that laborers will have the same compassion as Jesus did. How many have ever had a nurse that must have come out of a concentration camp? Turn over, drop your trousers. <laughs> you know, it's just nice to have somebody who's caring for your soul who has compassion. Pray the laborers have the same compassion that Jesus did. Pray that they will quickly answer, yes, yes, Lord, use me. Pray that they will get going and get busy laboring in every way possible. Pray that they will stay faithful laboring for Jesus and for souls. I'd never thought about what would I pray. I just said, Lord, send for the laborers. End of story. But now I'm praying for the laborers. Amen. It's so funny and so sad, Brother Andrew. Because it's no wonder that so few go and reach our world because so few of us pray for them. Now, how does God answer that prayer request? Well, through three things. Number one, through preaching. God is already answering Jesus' prayer request right now today on August 5th, 2018. Through people being reminded of that prayer request. It's starting to be answered right today. Secondly, it's answered through hearing His still, quiet, small voice in your heart. You can listen to me all day and you can go straight to hell. You better listen to the voice of God from the Word of God as it cuts you to the heart and you realize, that ain't Craig talking. There's another voice. I heard a man, his name was Richard Lewis, missionary to Kenya. He'd been there for 30 years. There he was preaching that Wednesday night in the first missions conference I'd ever been in and I had never met missionaries. I was just newly saved. And as he got up and he talked about his ministry had showed those old pictures of the people he had won to God and uh, 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 translated portions of the Scripture too because they didn't have the Bible in their language. And he talking about all that thing. I heard another voice saying, I'd like to use you, Craig. Richard Lewis didn't come down to me and says, I want to use you. No, no, no. Somebody else was talking to me. Amen. And the way that that prayer of Jesus gets answered is when we start listening. As he pulls and hugs and convicts and breaks our hearts to conform to his will. And there's a third way that God answers that prayer, and that's when we surrender to such a powerful call. You will resist it, you'll fight it, and you'll be scared of it. And there's not a person who's ever tried to serve God. There's not a person who's ever tried to give a gospel track. I was talking to Brother David earlier in the week. Every time I go out on a Saturday, and I, my very first door, do you know what's happening to me? The very first door, I'm panicking. Who's it going to be? What am I going to say? I'm saved 37 years. I've preached 26 years. I have, uh, uh, I have taught Bible Institute years and years. I've, I've read through my Bible so many times. I've done all this stuff, and I go up to that door, and I go, I wish somebody would phone me. Give me a distraction. You say, you do. yes, I do. Because you, you, are, you are facing your fears. You are facing your own limitations. And you're going, I can't do it. And then when you do knock, you say, I hope they're not home. <laughs> so don't sit there and go, well, pastor, I just, every time I get ready to go out, I just, I just give up. So do I. So do I. But then I overrule it. And I surrender to the pull of God. I just say, you win, God. Somebody's got to be the boss of my life, and it better not be me. Amen. Well, let me tell you what it looks like when God answers this prayer. I'll tell you, 
I'll know God is answering this prayer in our church and in my life when we all start to follow our example. When we all start to do as Jesus did. The work of the gospel is not for others to do, folks. I'm not, now, the work of preaching, that's my job. Amen? Sometimes Dan, sometimes Andrew, sometimes others stand up here and preach. But the work of this pulpit is my job. You understand me? God didn't say pray for preachers, did he? He said pray for laborers who will do whatever is necessary to get the gospel into somebody's hand. And we've got to realize that if you surrender to God, if you submit your life into his hand, you don't have to, don't sit there and say, oh, hey, Lord, I, I, I'm ready to be a preacher. Don't pray that. Pray I'm ready to labor. Pray I'm ready to go where you want me to go. Do whatever you want me to do. You see, Jesus, back there in verse 35, he went everywhere, teaching, preaching, and helping. How far will you go? How can anyone claim to follow Christ and then not do as he did? Hmm. I, I always watch it when, when Princess Diana became queen. 4,000 women got their hair cut the same way. Do you notice that? All these girls who were brunettes became blonde and then, you know, fancy hairstyle. LeBron gets a new uh, sponsor for shoes and then every kid's got to have the same kind of shoes as LeBron, Brown, and uh, some other sportsman, you know, uh, gets his hair mohawked and all of a sudden all the kids get their hair. It's, it's, let me just say this. How come we're not like our hero? How come we're not following our example? When we start to, we'll know that God is moving and allowed to move in our church and our lives when we start doing what he did. That means, that means teaching the gospel. You ever, you ever try to explain it to somebody? I, it's great to hand out a gospel tract. It's great when you don't know what to say to just read through the gospel track. I've probably, in my, my Christian life, I've probably led four or maybe five people to Christ just reading the track to them because I was too green to know how to do it. And then they, all right, I'm ready to get saved. You, go, you are? <laughs> well, it says here on the back, all you do is got to bow your head and ask him to save you. Would you do that? You don't have to know the whole thing or the whole rocket science of it all, but at some point you ought to be able to explain what the gospel is. You ought to be able to explain that Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again, all according to the Bible, like it prophesied. And he did it for them. Could you stand up on a, preach, on a street corner? I was watching some, some folks uh, over there in England. Actually, yesterday, there were some guys up in uh, Belfast, that, that queer parade going down the street. And those guys were up there now. They did their best. Praise God. They were fools for Christ. And they gave them the gospel and says, there's hope for you. You need to repent. Could you do that? We need to be able to do it. You know, we'll actually, we'll actually start helping people. I'm glad you're coming to church. I'm glad you want to get help. I'm glad you, you want your family to get help. I'm glad you want to rebuild some things in your life. I'm glad you want to do some small things for God. But let me tell you, everything you do will be for others. Will you help somebody? Will you determine that your life is going to be something that says, I want to make a difference in somebody else's life. Lord, you've done everything good for me. Help me be a comfort, a blessing, and a help to somebody. That's when we'll know this prayer is being answered. And you'll find, and we'll find a bunch of people in this room lowering themselves. I'm glad we're not like the Galway races. Can you imagine, Miss Kathy? You've never been to the Galway races, have you? All right. How many of you know what the Galway races is all about? I know they put horses there, but it's not about horses. It's about women in their hats. And I mean, they put on a show, and I mean, goodness gracious, these things are biggest. you think sombreros were back in the vogue. And it's a big show, let me tell you. You know, I'm glad our church is a little different, where you come in and there is no competition. Hallelujah, amen. I couldn't care less. And I know they have fun, and nobody's debating whether they're having a good time. The point is, I wouldn't want to have a church like that, would you? I wouldn't want to, they couldn't get through the doors. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what Jesus did? He became low. 
Mark 9, 35 says, And he sat down, and he called his twelve unto him, and said unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same is going to be last of all and servant of all. I, I, I look forward to seeing a bunch of new servants this month after missions revival. Secondly, we start feeling how we felt. Verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion, which means he was broken. He cared about the multitudes, not just a few. You know how many people are on this planet? Actually, I asked, you know, you get onto Google and you say population of the world, and as of the end of 2017, there are 7,536,000,000. I went, when I got saved, when God called me to be a missionary, and I found out I was going to Ireland, we didn't have Google at that time. We had Brita uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> and the population of the world just a few earlier was four and a half billion people. I couldn't comprehend four billion. I can't comprehend seven and a half billion people. I can't comprehend it. But certainly, shouldn't I not ignore it? Shouldn't I care about multitudes? Shouldn't I care about them being lost? And shouldn't I care that they still need a Messiah? There are some, there are some scum buckets out there that are offering false hopes. Some of them are very religious. Some of them are coming to Cork at the end of this month. <laughs> coming to Ireland, sorry, going to Phoenix Park. Offering a false hope. And there will be multitudes there in Phoenix Park. There are, there are multitudes in the Middle East. There are countless hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people who have no hope. And you know what? We can get on our little busy way, first world country. Why should I care? Because Jesus said care. We'll all start feeling like how he felt. Every time we read a prayer letter about Zoltan Kish over in Hungary, our hearts will burn and our hearts will break and say, Lord, I'm not there, but God, I, I beg you, please save them like I want you to save my family. And it, it will actually see God answering prayer when we all start fulfilling our duty. When we start fulfilling our duty. You know, do the math. Folks, there's a lot to do. And we need to be ashamed. What do we got to be embarrassed about, Brother Leather, that we're not doing it? A lot of you grow, grew up in a day, a lot of the older folks in here grew up, you did chores at home. Your mom worked not only at home, but worked a job. And, and it, there was no Xbox, Y box, Z box. There was no PlayStation. There was no. Uh, uh, smartphones, there, were, there, were, there, was, there was dirt, and there were shovels, and there were chores. And if you didn't do the chore, mama had to do it. Are you with me? And when you got a house full of kids, and only two of them are doing the work, and the other five are sitting there playing outside, and they're not doing it, you know what that creates? Bitterness. It creates a situation where everybody burned out, and mama most of all. You know what God asks? Everybody get busy. So the pastor's not burned out. So that, so that people who love serving God stay loving serving God. Because, folks, I got this, I got news for you. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, it means I don't have to do it. Amen? Because it's going to get done. But God said, start fulfilling the ministry, start fulfilling our duty. He didn't say, if you feel like it. He didn't say, if it's in your schedule. He didn't say, if you're single. He didn't say, if your wife's happy. He didn't say, if everything's going right. No, he just says, go, do, wherever you are. Some of the greatest soul winners, some of the greatest people of God who made the greatest impact on this world have been in hospital beds have been dying in the flames of fire on a burning stake, and they affected the world because they didn't give up and they didn't shirk. What will it look like when Christ's prayer request is being fulfilled is when we're praying. Okay, sneak that in. I would say pray two things. One, pray that asks, God, to not only send forth labors, but also to make us 
some of those laborers. Here's the invitation. What's the goal of this message? I write this down and I say, Lord, what do you want me to do with this message? You spoke to my heart. Man, I learned a lot. I can't even give you a third of what God spoke to me about. But the goal of this message is to get every one of you to believe in the need for the gospel. Is it something you could take or leave, or is it something that saved your soul? Is it something that gave you back your mind? Made the difference in your life? Is the gospel important to you? I want you to believe that it's important to this world, too. To get you to start praying for laborers. I'll know it's being answered, Brother Dan, if I get a bunch of people here on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen? You'll discourage this preacher more than you know if you're not here on Wednesday night. And I think you'll grieve the Holy Spirit of God, too. You say, well, I don't normally... Shut up. Do not tell me you don't normally come on Wednesday night. It's a church meeting. We need you. We need to pray for our missionaries. Our, pressure, our missionaries need us to pray for them. And we need to pray for laborers. And to get you to stand up and say to God, here am I, send me. You see, when you start praying for laborers, you start praying for God to soften men and women's hearts. And you start to pray for God to be able to direct them easily and to get them serving and get them faithful. All of a sudden you realize, that's me. That's what I want to be. It's time we actually believed in the labor, not in the glory. You know what a preacher has? He's... he's a pastor gets up and preaches whether people are there or people are not. Whether people love him or people hate him. Whether it's a popular message or the most unpopular thing you could ever say. We are not politically correct. But you know what I believe? Not in my position, but I believe in my labor. And when there's a labor in the word, there is fruit. I believe in the labor. I don't... I don't I don't entertain. I don't come up with, you know I'm no good at jokes. Okay, that worked. I believe in the labor, though. The time I get up here on a Sunday morning, I will have spent, probably on one message, I will have spent 12 hours. And that's not a brag. That's to wake you up to the fact I believe in the labor. And I, I do it because first God's got to work on me, and it takes nine of those hours to work on me. I got to believe in the labor. You got to believe in the going. You got to believe that when you take a gospel track, it's going to work. But it's not going to work if you don't walk. Amen? How are they going to hear without a preacher? Then we need to believe in the potential. I believe in Ireland having a great awakening. I have seen in my lifetime Ireland go from at least some morals to some of the most pitiful levels near hell. As fast as it's fallen, it can bounce. But it doesn't happen by accident. The reason why Ireland has fallen off the map morally, now they're off spiritually, I know that, but the reason why they've fallen off the map morally and intelligently <laughs> is because there's been a concerted effort. We talk about the Russians interfering in elections. The devil's interfering. And the devil and the world and the flesh is interfering with people. So all they do is they buy into this stupid way of thinking of live for yourself. It's all about me. It's all for me. And they end up in the worst pits. You know what? Why don't we lift up? It's all about Jesus. It's all about righteousness. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's believe in the potential. Let's believe that you go out of the field, somebody's going to get saved, and then not back just one, but lots. My dad sent us, uh, uh, when I was a kid, um, uh, about nine years old, my dad, for a summer, we would go every weekend, and we'd go to this farm, and they'd give us this basket, and there were rows of, of, of green beans, the string beans, you know what I'm talking about? And we had to pick it for hours. And, and, and we'd, uh, uh, the next week, we'd go, and we'd go, and, and we'd, break off the corn cobs in there. And then, boy, the most best one I ever got was in the strawberry patch. And pulling those strawberries off of there, throwing in there. I never wanted to leave that place, amen, and all that stuff. But let me tell you, you went in with nothing, you came home with a basket full. And there was nothing like sitting down and washing that basket. And we made fresh strawberry ice cream. And I'm talking about the ice cream that you had to crank. I don't know if I'm talking out of your league. 
but in an ice cream maker. It's filled with ice on the outside and this metal tray on the inside. You put fresh cream in, put all your, your uh, uh, fruit in, and you put the lid on, and then you sit there. Oh, there's a crank on the side. I had to think of where it was. And you crank that thing for about an hour, man. And then you open it up. It was the most glorious taste. There was fruit from our labor. Best memories of my life were bringing home those baskets of strawberries. Now, you'll never have more fun than being when somebody gets saved, when somebody responds and says, you're right, I need to get born again. We need to believe in the potential, and we need to believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Oh, we're glad to take heaven. Yeah, Lord, give me that forgiveness. Lord, yes, give me that family you got for me. God, give me all the blessings you got for me, but don't ask me to do what I don't want to do. We need to believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So I'd like to pray right now. I'd like you to stand with me and bow your head. And let's begin to pray for laborers. Let's begin to answer, see God answer this prayer request in our church and in our country. Heavenly Father, we as a church, we bow. It's just as if we sat there watching you minister, and you do, to so many people. And as you turn to your disciples, you have now spoken to us. And you've asked us to pray for laborers, to go straight to the throne of the Lord of the harvest, that he would push, that he would agitate, that he would make uncomfortable a group of people who would never be happy until they were serving, until they were laboring. So Lord, I pray for laborers. I pray for multitudes of them, because there are multitudes more who need them, who will be faithful to go, who will be encouraged to go. We've thought of little things like our track a day, little program. Lord, I'm so grateful it's working. I'm so grateful when a gospel track is put into anybody's hand. God, we need, we need a track a person. We need laborers, God. This world, I pray, needs what we have. And we're not what we ought to be until we are answering this prayer request. So first we're praying. We're praying for others. We're praying that they will be soft towards your will. We're praying that there are men and women, teenagers, young boys and girls, who will not fight or resist your pull on them. Pray that you will give them the same heart that you have. For the lost, that they will not see eye to eye with people, but they will see heart to heart with souls. And they will love them, even though they may hate us. And I pray for laborers that will every day wake up and say, Lord, please use me. My greatest success story will be that God used me. Whether at work or at school, I don't care. Lord, just use me. Oh, God, use me. I pray the laborers will say that every day. I pray the laborers will stay busy, not be just on and off again, but God will just get, get serving, get going, get laboring. Yes, there's, there's children's church classes to teach. Yes, there's work to do down at the office. Yes, there's so many things. But we're not talking about what to do. God, I'm asking that they would just be willing to do. That they would be. I pray that they would be faithful. Lord Jesus, please send forth the laborers. Lord, if you would choose, send forth us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.